Earlier today, an atheist said this, If anyone were to be able to prove to me that God existed, then I would gladly change my mind. Well, I think that is an honest uh, thing to say. I mean, surely, if someone proved to you something existed, you would indeed rationally believe that it existed. Fair enough. But I wrote this back. What good would that information do you? If you knew God existed, would you know which God was true? If two beings appeared to you, both claiming to be God, calling the other one a liar, would you be able to tell who was telling the truth? Could you use science to tell the difference? Of course not. That means you don't know who God is, which means God could be standing right there in front of you and you wouldn't know him. This is why the Bible says we must engage in a relationship with God, not simply a head knowledge of him. If you are unwilling to even entertain the idea of God existing, how could you ever believe what he has revealed about himself since the beginning of creation? If the Bible is God's written word to mankind, take it or leave it, and it says what God wants us to know about him and what he wants for our lives, and you reject it, you've thereby rejected God. By believing what the Bible says, we believe on him who gave us the Bible, which is God, and therefore we know God and how to identify him when he appears to us. Without the knowledge of God being knowing his character and having a relationship with him, which is not a scientific endeavor, rather it is actual relationship with him and knowing him personally, then unfortunately for the atheists, knowing that God exists is absolutely useless information to them. At this point, the atheist can only say this, well, I can't begin a relationship with a God I do not believe exists. Well, I don't care if you believe in God or not, that doesn't change if he exists or not, quite frankly. I mean, who are you to claim to know if God exists or not? You're just a little human on a little planet, and, you know, you throw that right back at me. Why do I feel that I have the right to say I know God exists? Because I have a relationship with him. And you say, well, that's subjective, and you might just be crazy in the head. Okay, so millions of people are crazy in the head? Well, you'll say Richard Dawkins wrote about this. This is called the God Delusion. Men are just crazy. So everyone just believes all all this crazy stuff, and there's no God. Well, let me run this by you, Mr. Atheist. Do you know everything? Well, you're not Thunderfoot, so clearly you probably only know about half of everything that there is to know. So, and that's maybe modest. So, you know half of everything. Is it possible that God exists in the half that you don't know? You certainly have to be open to that idea because you don't know. And if you don't know something, then anything's possible, right? So you might say, well, what I do know, the 50% of everything that I do know, seems to indicate that there is no God. Yeah, on, on what basis? Well, the atheist would say this. Well, there's evil in the world. You know, why, why are there viruses and bacteria and abortions and murder and all, you know, all kinds of yucky, ugly stuff? Well, what if I told you the Bible gives us a perfectly rational answer for it? Well, you'll say, I don't believe the Bible. Well, like I said, I don't care if you believe it or not. The question is, is it true or not? And we might as well look at what it says. Uh, the Bible says God is perfect, and thereby he has a perfect standard. So when he created the universe, he made it perfect, and he gave mankind perfect free will. And the choice to obey God or disobey God was given to mankind because God wanted a relationship. There's that word again. He wanted a relationship with mankind, and relationships, love, must be chosen freely with the option of not loving. I mean, if I said I am going to force you to love me, you'd be like, well, you can't do that. Exactly. God created us as beings with free moral agency, and we can choose to do good. And that's kind of the beauty of choice, and that's actually the beauty of love, because it's chosen. I mean, if I asked a girl to marry me, and she said yes, how much more, uh, I don't know, how much more awesome is that than a girl who I forced to marry me, right? So God created a perfect world with perfect free will. Mankind chose to disobey God, and at that point, the world... Uh, fell away from God because, well, God's perfect, and the world thereby became imperfect through mankind's sin. Sin now was present in the world. So the perfection that God had once endowed upon the earth and his protective care and hand on it was removed, and this is called the fall. That's when pain and death and sickness and viruses and all that stuff entered the world. Now you say, well, that's a lovely story, but, well, I can't verify that if that's true. All I see is the fall. I don't see the perfection. Well, here's what I see. I see a world with many animals, and this is what the Bible says, that animals produce after their kind, and 
Evolutionists say things are getting better over time, although not always necessarily. You know, they say some things get bigger and stronger, others adapt better to survive in different environments, and well, it's just a blind, crazy process going in every which way direction. It's not particularly going in any direction, and uh, and that's that. We don't need to invoke God or the fall or any of that stuff into the. And here's where I disagree. I see grass making grass, I see dogs making dogs, I see humans making humans, I see apples making apples, and I never see any variance beyond that. Yes, there are different types of dogs, yes, there are different types of apples, but they stay the same because I believe God created them perfect in the beginning and they produce after their kind, just as God said. I believe everything is so radically different from each other that they are closed systems and cannot convert from one kind into another. And that's my stance and there is no uh, contemporary science that proves otherwise. And inevitably, this is where an atheist will say, why don't you just look at the fossil record? And I have, and it supports creation. It doesn't support evolution at all. The biblical view of history, which says there was a worldwide flood, worldwide catastrophe about 4,400 years ago explains why we find animals the size of dinosaurs buried in the mud with their entire skeleton structures intact as if they were buried rapidly and had no time to decay or weather or be picked apart or decompose or anything like that. So when I look at the fossil record, I don't see any of the transitions that Darwin predicted that there would be an abundance of them, which we, quite frankly, have none of. All of these supposed transitions are actually not transitions, and although atheists and evolutionists go back and forth on them, I firmly suggest that there is no such thing as a transitional fossil between any of the major kinds of animals, and I stand firmly on that. So, what we see is this, a world with design that is in decline. It is decaying. It was once perfect, it is falling away from its original vision, and God has given us a written record of why this happened. He revealed his message to prophets over 3,000 years to 40 different authors who wrote over 60 different books, who all claimed inspiration from the same God who had the same message, who entered into world history exactly when he foretold before the destruction of the second temple 2,000 years ago, in the person of Jesus Christ the Messiah, as all the prophets foretold. He came, he died, as the prophets foretold. He came back from the dead, as the prophets foretold, and now the Gentiles and the Jews worship the God of Israel as foretold. And he also made some other prophecies which have come true very recently. The Bible said that Israel would be reborn in a single day, and in 1948, after 2,000 years of exile, the unheard of rebirth of a nation that had been scattered for 2,000 years and maintained their national identity returned to their land, Israel, after 2,000 years, just as God said. No nation in history has ever been exiled from their land, maintained an identity, only to regather and get their nation back 2,000 years later, but the Jews did as foretold. So I want to just introduce a concept to you. Mankind was created with God. We've been talking about that. We had a relationship with him. However, that relationship was severed when we sinned against him, so the creation became a place of sin, not righteousness, and it was thus separated from the holy and perfect God. However, God loves his creation, and he is sovereign, and he wants to repair and restore that relationship. However, sin is the problem of separation, and God cannot provide blessing on us while we continue in sin, otherwise he would be supporting our sin, and God has indeed judged sin, and says that he will once again judge it and destroy it, and he can have no part with it, and thank God for that. He has a perfect standard, and he's not going to lower his standard for us. Now, God introduced his Torah, his law, to the Jews and had them build a temple where God could dwell. This was a holy place. What made it holy? Because people, by faith, in obedience to God, created a place where God could dwell. It was righteous. There was no sin there. And, just as we understand through the temple God dwelled with us, God became a man who we call Jesus Christ. What is the importance of Jesus Christ? Well, just as by one man, Adam, sin entered the world, by one man living a perfect sinless life, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, righteousness has come into the world. So now God can pour out his spirit on mankind. Whoever will repent from their sins and put their faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Jesus Christ will be granted to you, and your transgressions and sins against God will be washed away. That does not mean the consequences of sin will not be felt. We are still living in a fallen world, and our bodies have sinned and they will die. However, those who have genuinely repented from their sins and put their faith in Christ will be born again of the spirit of God according to the promise of scripture, be forgiven of their sins, and when they die, go and live with the Lord forever. 
Those who do not, however, will face the righteousness and wrath of God for their sins against him. And so many atheists at this point say, well, that's great. God gives me the choice to either obey him and love him, or he's going to burn me. That doesn't sound like much of a choice. Well, I say this to you. What choice are you giving God if you will not acknowledge his existence, and if he indeed made the world and has a purpose for it, and you're not willing to listen to him or do things his way, what possible purpose could he have for you? Why should he give you one more breath, one more chance to live? Why shouldn't he judge you for, well, ruining the entire planet? Remember, one man took one bite of one forbidden fruit, and look what happened. Why should God go easy on you? Let's actually just look at the law really quickly. Have you ever told a lie? That makes you a liar. Have you ever stolen anything? That makes you a thief. Have you ever used God's name as a blaspheming curse word? Well, that makes you a blasphemer against the God that gave you life. Have you ever committed adultery or fornication? Well, Jesus said that you're an adulterer in your heart if you even look at someone to lust after them. Have you ever murdered anyone? Well, Jesus said if you're, if you're even angry with someone unjustly, you're a murderer in your heart. You see, God's standard is perfect.